Hello, everyone, and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier, and today I'm having a look at yet another pair of instant cameras, but not, in this case, Polaroid cameras. Rather, these are manufactured by Kodak and are part of a short-lived series of cameras produced by the company between 1976 and 1986, when a patent infringement lawsuit brought by Polaroid forced them to cease production. And the ways in which these are very similar, yet very different from Polaroid cameras is absolutely fascinating. So I thought we might have a closer look at this today. Now, throughout the video, I'm going to be referring often to the engineering and the history of Polaroid cameras. So if you want to catch up on that subject, please check out my three-part video series on Polaroid cameras, link in the description. Now, interestingly enough, between 1963 and 1969, Polaroid and Kodak had an amicable working relationship, since Kodak produced the negative basis for all of Polaroid's peel-apart pack instant film. However, throughout this period, Kodak grew increasingly envious of Polaroid's domination of the instant photography market, a monopoly that was enabled by a veritable wall of patents covering pretty much every aspect of the instant photography process. Nonetheless, Kodak decided it wanted in on this market and started developing its own pack film and camera. However, in 1972, when Polaroid introduced its revolutionary SX70 camera and integral film, Kodak changed course and decided to produce its own integral film and camera, starting with PR10 film and the EK4 camera, both released in 1976. And you'll notice that the EK4 camera has a much slimmer form factor than the Polaroid SX70 style cameras. This is because Kodak Instant Film works a little bit differently from Polaroid Instant Film. So Polaroid Instant Film is designed to be exposed from the front. And so the cameras have to integrate an angled mirror to flip the image around to the correct orientation. Kodak Instant Film, on the other hand, is exposed from the rear and thus doesn't need a mirror, and the cameras can be a lot more compact. And this rear exposure system also confers a number of other advantages. For example, Kodak Instant Film tends to have better color registration and greater light sensitivity because the light doesn't have to go through several different layers to get to the emulsion stack as it does in Polaroid Film. Also, since the top layer of the film doesn't need to transmit light to the emulsion stack, it can be given a matte finish, which makes the finished print much more resistant to fingerprints. The chemistry of Kodak film is also a little bit simpler. So since Polaroid film is designed to be exposed from the front, it needs a layer that is transparent during exposure, opaque during the development process, and then transparent again at the end of development. And as I covered in my previous videos, this is accomplished by putting titanium dioxide pigment inside the reagent that is spread between the emulsion stack and the receiving layer as the photo is ejected out of the camera. And this acts as a chemical screen that protects the emulsion layer from light while it is developing. And after a certain amount of time, the pH of the reagent drops and this causes the pigment to become transparent, revealing the final image. Now, Kodak Instant Film does use a chemical screen to protect the emulsion, but it does not actually need to become transparent at the end of the development process. Rather, the dyes released from the emulsion by the reagent simply migrate through this opaque screen before being deposited on the receiving layer. And this system conferred a further unique advantage that Kodak would exploit in its trim print series of instant film. And so in this film, you could actually peel away the finished receiving layer from the now useless negative layer and reagent pod, giving you a print that you could more easily place in a frame or a photo album than the equivalent Polaroid print. Now, one last thing to mention about Kodak instant film is that the diffusion and deposition process of the dyes is backwards from Polaroid film. So as we covered in my previous video, in Polaroid film, you have three different emulsion layers sensitized to red, green, and blue light. And behind these are three dye layers in the corresponding complementary colors, cyan, magenta, and yellow. And the exposed sections of each emulsion layer trap the dye behind it and stop it from migrating over to the receiving layer, but it allows the two other dyes to migrate and they will combine to reproduce the original color. 
Well, Kodak Instant Film worked very similar to what is known as reversal film, which is used to produce transparent images such as slides or motion picture film without needing to go through a negative intermediary. So in this system, the three emulsion layers are sensitized not to red, green, and blue, but rather to cyan, magenta, and yellow. And they contain dye developers in red, green, and blue. So once the film is exposed and the reagent is spread over top of the emulsion and the photo ejected from the camera, the developer actually releases the dyes from the unexposed regions of each emulsion layer. And these will migrate towards the receiving layer to reform the original image. Now, I just find it fascinating how these two companies were able to come up with such different solutions to the same problem. And it just goes to show how much ingenuity you can stimulate when you are desperately trying to get around your rival's patents. Now, Kodak Instant Cameras also differed from their Polaroid rivals in a number of key ways. For example, many models lacked automatic film ejection, and you actually had to pull out a little handle and crank it to eject the film though later models did have electric ejection. And while Polaroid film packs featured an integrated Polypulse battery to run the exposure system, the flash, and the film rollers, thus meaning that if you had film, you had a battery, Kodak opted to go for a separate 6-volt J-style battery. And just like Polaroid cameras, Kodak Instant cameras were initially equipped with a multi-flashbulb unit. In Polaroid's case, this was called the flash bar, and it was horizontally mounted, whereas in Kodak's case, it was called the flip flash and was vertically mounted. And while this might look a little bit silly and clumsy, as I covered in my previous video on the history of camera flashes, link in the description, this had the advantage of reducing red eye since the light would be coming into the subject's eye at a steep angle compared to the axis of the lens. Now, just like Polaroid, Kodak would eventually come up with electronic flash units, either ones that plugged into the same socket as the flip flash or integrated into the camera itself. Right, so let's have a look at our first camera. This is the Kodak EK2, also known as the Handle, and was first released in 1977. Now, in my last video on Polaroid, I stated that this is one of the ugliest consumer cameras ever released and has one of the least sexy names of any product. Though handling it now, I guess this really isn't any uglier than, say, a Polaroid Big Swinger or Color Pack series camera. Now, just like those cameras, this was aimed at the lower end of the consumer market, and this is completely made out of plastic and has relatively few features or controls. So at the front, we have a fixed focus lens, and beside it, a photoelectric cell for the automatic exposure system. Underneath, we have a little dial for adjusting the brightness of the photograph. Now, on the other side of the lens, we have a test button, which works in conjunction with a little light on the top, to tell you if the battery has enough charge. Now, just behind the exposure adjustment wheel, we have our battery compartment for our J-size 6-volt battery. And on the top of the camera body, we have our socket for our flip flash. Now, above our eponymous handle, we have a very simple viewfinder with a rectangular aiming reticle. And on the right side of the camera body, we have our mechanical shutter release. And there's an interesting feature here, which is if you pull this only halfway back, then a little light in the viewfinder will indicate whether there is insufficient light to take a photograph, whereupon you would either fit your flip flash or find a brighter scene photograph. And then pulling that all the way back activates the shutter. And then finally, we have our fold out crank handle for ejecting the developed film. And just like with the earlier Polaroid pack film cameras, you had to make sure to smoothly eject the film so that the reagent was evenly spread over the inside. Now, if we flip down this little latch in the back, we can open up the rear of the camera. You can see the two rollers in the top, as well as the compartment for the film. Right, so I happen to have an empty pack of PR144-10 film. And this is part of Kodak's earlier ISO 150 line of film. They would produce an ISO 300 line as well, though it does have the trim print feature that I mentioned before, where you could peel off the finished receiving layer from the negative layer and reagent pod. And as you can see, this is marked with an orange line, as is the inside of the camera, so you know how to pop the film inside. Now, just like Polaroid film packs, these contain 10 exposures, though no integral battery. And while Polaroid prints were 4 by 4 and 7 eighths inches, the Kodak prints were 3.5 by 4 and a quarter inches. 
closer to a regular 35mm print. Though unfortunately, the Kodak film packs were considerably more expensive than their Polaroid equivalents. $10 compared to $3 to $5. Right, so the second camera I have here is the Color Burst 50, which was released in 1979 and retailed for $45, around $160 today. Now, this is a little bit more sophisticated than the handle in that it has an electric automatic film ejection system, but otherwise, most of the features and controls are identical. We have a fixed focus lens, we have an automatic exposure system with a manual adjustment, although in this case it is a slider as opposed to a wheel. We have a socket for a flip flash or an electronic flash module on the top. We have an exposure counter on the rear right. We have a mechanical shutter release on the right. And then we also have a simple viewfinder which doesn't even have any kind of aiming reticle. Now, in later versions where you could actually adjust the focus, you had an interesting range finder which consisted of a circle that you had to adjust so that it just framed the subject's head. And finally, we have our battery compartment in the rear and a latch on the bottom that opens up a door for loading the film pack. And to release the empty pack, you simply pull up on this little metal latch and it pops right out. Now one last little feature to mention on this particular camera is this series of three little depressions on the back surface. And these actually came with a set of self-adhesive letters that you could stick inside these depressions to add your initials and personalize your camera, which is kind of a neat little idea. Now Kodak would release a number of other instant camera models of increasing sophistication, including the Color Burst 250, which integrated an electronic flash. Indeed, it was the very first instant camera from any brand to do so. And the Kodomatic 980, which was the only one of the Kodak instant cameras to have automatic focusing. Unfortunately for Kodak, going up against Polaroid proved an enormous gamble, and while Kodak's formidable marketing machine meant that they were able to sell quite a few instant cameras in the first few years after their introduction, Polaroid came down on them hard and fast, suing them for infringing on 12 of its patents and costing it some $12 billion in revenue. Now, this lawsuit would drag on for some 10 years, and at the end of it, in 1985, the courts ruled in Polaroid's favor charging Kodak with violating seven of the 12 claim patents, ordering them to immediately cease production of all instant cameras and film, and provide compensation to customers who had purchased these products. So consumers could either mail in the entire camera or just pry off the nameplate as proof of purchase in return for either a check or a gift certificate towards the purchase of other Kodak products. And this is why often when you find these cameras in thrift and vintage stores today, the nameplate will be missing. Though these two examples came in their original boxes and are completely intact. Now, finally, to add insult to injury, in 1991, Kodak was forced to pay Polaroid nearly $1 billion in damages, which, while considerably less than the exaggerated $12 billion that Polaroid had originally sued for, was still quite a substantial amount. And thus ended Kodak's brief foray into the instant photography market. And because the film and spare parts immediately dried up, these cameras became essentially worthless. And today, these aren't really considered collector's items. So if you come across them in a flea market or an antique store, you can usually pick them up for next to nothing. Now, one last interesting thing to note is that in 1981, Fujifilm in Japan released its own line of instant film and cameras under the brand name Photorama. And these were actually quite similar to the Kodak products being rear exposed and having an ISO of 160 while Kodak film had an ISO of 150. So they were actually roughly compatible with one another. However, this similarity meant that Polaroid launched a separate lawsuit against Fuji for patent rights in Japan. And when Kodak lost its lawsuit, Fuji immediately entered a technology sharing agreement with Polaroid. And this is actually to Polaroid's benefit because they wanted to enter the digital storage medium market, a field in which Fujifilm had extensive experience and expertise. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Uh, when I spotted these in an antique store, I immediately knew I had to do a follow up to my Polaroid series, and I hope you enjoyed it. Anyways, I will see you next time on another video where we'll look at yet more fascinating cameras and other devices just like these. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.